The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 11th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 11, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 this morning. <coughs> I'm going to try real hard not to cough into the mic, Mike. I'm you know. Uh, Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts open, God, to receive what it is you have for us this day. May we hear your words, while whatever words I put in the way are quickly forgotten. Be with us now, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, to most folks, Gary is a nice guy. He's polite, courteous, but can be straightforward. He's quiet. He does his job well and pretty much stays out of people's way. However, most folks don't really know Gary. Those of us who do know a man with a long history of abusive relationships, domestic violence arrests, restraining orders, We know a man who receives packages wrapped in brown paper so children's eyes won't accidentally see what arrived in his mailbox. We know a man who has cheated folks out of thousands of dollars, who's lied to countless others, a man who's taken part in more than one affair with a married woman. We know a man who gets up every morning to put on a mask of humility and confidence, to hide the inner turmoil of sinfulness, of greed, of self-loathing. We know the real Gary, a man who is trying so hard to preserve himself in his own way of life that he overlooks anyone he may hurt along the way. I worked with Gary, went over to his house once or twice, and I remember one of the first times I went to Gary's house, he showed me inside, and the house was much like the man himself, clean, dusted, well-lit, And even though Gary was a heavy smoker, there wasn't even a hint of smell of cigarette smoke in the house. Just just the right amount of, I guess it was Glade or something. His house served as a sort of different mask. Covering up what we all really knew about him. What he wasn't embarrassed to share with those of us who really knew him. But I remember though what really caught my eye in Gary's house was strange. On his coffee table, which had very recently been wiped down with a rag and some pledge, I'm sure, there was a neat stack of a few magazines about antique cars, a nice little wicker basket where he kept the remote for the surround sound, the television, the DVD player. And then there was this black fake leather Bible. You know the kind you get, right? It's not really leather. It looks like one of those leather Bibles until you pick it up and you oh yeah, it's just heavy black paper. Had gold letters on the front, gold gilded pages. I was surprised 
to see in Gary's house a copy of the good book sitting there on the coffee table. But then I noticed something else in his living room. On the wall opposite of his coffee table was a rather large print in a really gaudy gold frame. It was an image of a field, a pasture, a breeze maybe blowing through it. There on the right-hand side of this picture was a man with long hair, a beard, red and purple robes, holding a little baby lamb in his arms. I think the 23rd Psalm may have been written in the clouds. It was a picture of Jesus. I was a bit shocked. Gary's got Jesus in his house? A picture of Jesus on the wall? Had he found religion over the weekend? Had he, had he suddenly changed and started to decorate his house to reflect the inner change in his own life? Well, he had walked into the kitchen, and when he came back, I asked him, I said, Gary, what's the deal with the Bible? You see, I was a new Christian myself. I don't know about you, if you come to faith later in life, you start to wonder who all might actually be Christians. Like we're all in some sort of secret club that nobody wants to talk about at work or at school or in the real world. And so you start to wonder, is Gary really a Christian? And so I asked him, I said, hey, what about this? What about Jesus on the wall? What's all this about? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, those are both gifts. I was going around with this Pentecostal girl. She thought it'd do me some good to have a picture of Jesus and a Bible. She thought it would straighten me out. But now I keep it out on the table so when them Jehovah's Witnesses come over or the Mormons knock on the door, they'll think I'm at least a little religious and won't try to convert me anymore. The Bible on the table, the painting on the wall, little more than deceptive decoration, an attempt to look religious. Maybe they had once been gifts, hopeful tools of reformation in the life of one who needs it like the rest of us, but now they were only trinkets strategically placed to avoid difficult and uncomfortable conversations. They were just there in the way to be dusted around and under. I suppose that's the way it can go sometimes. Folks can get a taste of religion, a sampling of faith, hear the promise that comes with being part of a bigger movement, of something bigger than ourselves. But then time grinds on, life progresses relatively unchanged, and so they, they hang mementos on the wall and say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember when I used to be like that, when I thought it was a good idea to pray over supper. I remember when I used to be like that, every once in a while I'll pick the Bible up and flip through it. Oh yeah, I remember when I used to be like that, a religious program on the television, I might stop and watch it, I remember. But now, I'm not so gullible. I'm not so gullible to think that there's a God who hears my prayers, who cares about me, when my roof leaks, when my cancer doesn't go away, when my children suffer, when I don't get what I pray for. I suppose there are a lot of folks like that. Like Gary, folks who get a taste, then life continues on. Of course, there have been folks like that for centuries, even in the crowds that followed Jesus around during his ministry. We mostly just get a glimpse of those first days when they're riding that religious high of being part of a movement. They hang on every word Jesus says. They follow him around so much they forget to buy lunch. And there's that time they're all sitting there and they go, we've been following you around so much, we don't have anything to eat. They hung on his words. They followed him everywhere he went, even chased him out onto a boat, onto a lake. Jesus has fed them, he's healed them, he's taught them. And it seems like things in the God movement, what Jesus calls the kingdom of God or heaven, this God movement was great. How could people not be attracted to this? Especially people who lived in the first century. People who were under the watchful eye of a foreign power, not free in their own right, always under Roman watch, under Roman oppression. How could they not be attracted to this? But here comes Jesus proclaiming the rule of God, that God's dominion was coming to earth. Yeah, sign me up. Give me a ticket. Put the picture on the wall and the Bible on the table. I am in. A lot of Jesus' words sounded revolutionary. 
Almost like the words of those other messiahs who had come before him. And now, now this morning, we see a sort of climax of all of this momentum as Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, the capital of Jewish life, on the back of a donkey. Not humbly. We say that sometimes. He's coming in humbly. It's because it's not a white war horse. But no, they would have known exactly what was happening. Here comes Jesus riding into town on a donkey, just like the prophet Zechariah had said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. How? Riding on a donkey. Oh, they couldn't have missed it. The crowd goes nuts over all this prophetic imagery. They're seeing the culmination of their hopes and dreams riding into town. They see one who promises to restore the nation, to free them from their burdens. One who they believe will drive out the foreign oppressors and restore Jerusalem to its former greatness. One who will give them back their identity as the chosen and blessed people of God. And in their fervor, they begin to shed their cloaks, to take off their jackets, and in this somewhat strange act of reverence, spread them out on the road so a donkey can walk over them. Now, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Maybe it's simply a sign of enthusiasm. Maybe it's a demonstration of their devotion. I mean, it's obvious they're excited because we see later in another tradition that the Pharisees want Jesus to tell them to shut up. Tell them to hush. Because the Pharisees were concerned about causing a scene with so many Roman officials in town for the Passover. They didn't want things to get too disruptive. Jesus, just tell them to hush. And Jesus said, if they're silent, stone." cry out. So they spread their cloaks on the road and the donkey carrying Christ walks over them and I hope that's all that donkey did over their cloaks. But then what? Well I imagine the folks whose cloaks were in the road after the donkey walked by they picked them up, dusted them off, put them back on and got in line in the crowd behind Jesus. A crowd that would witness him drive out the money changers from the temple. A crowd that would listen to his parables, his teachings about taxes, resurrection, giving, and the signs of things to come. I imagine they picked up their cloaks and went on their way following Jesus right into Jerusalem. But something happened. Something happened that changed this crowd. These people who would shout for joy, wave palm branches, spread their cloaks on the road for an animal to walk on. Something happened that caused these people to go from shouting Hosanna to shouting crucify him. In just a matter of days. The new had worn off their religion. The shine has gone from the apple of their revolutionary hopes. Jesus rides into town on a colt, on a donkey, bringing to mind all these images of of kingly power and political upheaval. And what does Mark say he does? He walks in, he looks around, looks down at his watch, it's very late, and does nothing. Nothing. None of it happens. Instead, Jesus winds up arrested. How does it happen? What happened to this crowd that goes from shouting Hosanna to crucify him? I suppose it's the same thing that happens to any of us when we put our expectations of Christ ahead of the reality of who Jesus is. It's the same thing that happens so many times when people get on fire, as we used to say, for religion because of what they believe it promises them, what God will give them what they've got coming to them. It's the same thing that happens when folks believe that faith is about all all what's in it for me. And then someone comes along, say, no, no, no. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to take up your cross and die. When then they actually read the words of Christ and realize that faith isn't about getting what I want. In fact, it seems to be about the right opposite. It's the same thing that happens when people buy into the televangelist scams, when they send their money in exchange for miracle spring water or prayer claws, hoping that this magic check will appear in their mailbox like the man on the TV said it would. And when it doesn't, 
They flush the spring water down the toilet along with all their expectations about God. They throw that prayer cloth in the trash right along with anything they ever thought about God. It's the same thing that happens when people to continue to cling to the idea that what really matters is abiding by the rules, dressing the part, paying enough money, occupying a pew on Sunday, only to go home and realize they're still empty inside. Because there aren't enough rules to follow. There isn't enough money to give. There aren't enough church services to attend to earn the love of God. And so often, people get a taste of a life of faith. And maybe it's sugar-coated. Maybe it's watered down. Maybe it's 100% pure. But they get just a taste. And they're ready to lay their cloaks in the road for Jesus on Sunday. But then Monday comes. Monday comes and the emperor is still in Rome. Tuesday comes and the account is still overdrawn. Wednesday comes and the tumor hasn't gone away. Thursday comes and the addiction is still there. Friday comes and all that's left hanging in the closet is a dirty, donkey-smelling robe. And Saturday comes and there's nothing but a grave. And shouts of blessed is the king turn to shouts of crucify him. The truth is, so many of us are willing to follow a Palm Sunday Jesus. A Jesus who fulfills our hopes and our aspirations for power, wealth, and glory. A Jesus who comes riding in on a donkey with a crown on his head. We're all shouting Hosanna. We're willing to join the crowds who shout praises for Jesus, who spread their cloaks in the road because they believe Jesus is about to get rid of all those other people, all those other powers, all those other principalities that hold us down, that Jesus is about to give us our best life now. But when the road of faith gets rough, when God seems slow to answer our prayers, and we we wanted a Savior to tell us that everything is going to be all right, that we're going to get everything we've ever wanted in this life and the next. Instead, we get a Savior who tells us, if you want to be my disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Well, I don't think there are as many folks who want to follow that kind of Jesus as they do a Palm Sunday kind of Jesus. So many of us want Palm Sunday Jesus. But what we've been given is a good Friday, Jesus. A Christ who, despite our selfishness, died for us to show us the love of God, to manifest the reality of God's kingdom. So many of us want a Palm Sunday, Jesus. But what we've been given, thanks be to God, is an Easter Sunday, Jesus. A Lord who has conquered so much more than political power. A Christ who has overcome so much more than illness and disease. A God who has, in God's limitless love, died in order to be raised so that we might all know that Monday may come with all of its disappointments. Tuesday may come with its heartaches and pains. Wednesday may come with all of its burdens and trials. Thursday may come with temptations and faults. And Friday may come with our own shouts of crucify him. But thanks be to God that Sunday still comes. And with it come God's victory over all those things in our lives that cause us to think we've lost. So let's remember on this Palm Sunday, while it's easy to praise God when we're on the mountaintop, while it's easy to spread our cloaks on the road when our hearts are filled with expectations, That it's just Palm Sunday. And there's a Friday coming that tells us that this life of faith isn't all palm waving and rejoicing. That there are still dark days along the path and along the journey. But thanks be to God that after every failed expectation of Palm Sunday, after every death of Good Friday, there is a resurrection morning. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, on this Palm Sunday, God, it is easy for us to rejoice in your arrival and the good news of your triumph. God, help us to remember. 
Help us to remember, Lord, that even now as we walk this earth, that there are dark days still. Days when we may find ourselves even saying, crucify him. But that you love us anyway. That in spite of our selfishness, in spite of our sin, you still come out of the grave to call us to yourself. Lord, may you do just that even now. Call us away from ourselves and towards you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.